Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Murray. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to continue celebrating Black History Month with some great picture book biographies. The biography that we're going to read today is of John Roy Lynch, The Amazing Age of John Roy Lynch. This book is written by Chris Barton and it's illustrated by Don Tate. This book is also published by Erdman's Books for Young Readers. John Roy Lynch had an Irish father and an enslaved mother. By the law of the South before the Civil War, that made John Roy and his brother half Irish and all slave. His father lacked the power to change the law. He was just an overseer, a hired hand. Besides, while he may have loved these slaves, he most likely took the whip to others. But Patrick Lynch, it was said, had a plan, a plan to liberate Catherine and their children. The law would allow him to buy them. They would belong to him, but he could let them live as though they were free. John Roy was just a toddler in 1849 when his father took sick and died. Pat Lynch left all he had, including his unfinished plan, to a friend named Deal, but Deal did not liberate Catherine, nor John Roy, nor William. Deal kept them enslaved and sold them to a new owner. John Roy might have been free by the time that he was two, but he was not. Precious time, years of would-be freedom were lost. John Roy's new owner, Mr. Davis, did not send him out into the hot Louisiana cotton fields. Instead, Mr. Davis kept John Roy at his big home across the Mississippi River in the city of Natchez. His job was to fan Mrs. Davis, serve her ice water, open the door of her carriage, and shoo the flies from her table. She must have thought that he would be grateful for the privilege. In Sunday school, John Roy's ears heard more than they were intended to. He noticed how Mrs. Davis twisted scripture to encourage obedience to her and her husband, when they sang, to serve the present age, my calling to fulfill, O oh, may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. It was clear which master Mrs. Davis had in mind. Mrs. Davis said that she could not abide telling lies. She would boast of her own sister who claimed to have never lied. What do you think of that? Mr. Davis teased John Roy one day. I think she told a lie when she said that, he replied. Out of rage and spite and hurt, Mrs. Davis banished John Roy from the big house on Homochio Street. She sent him across the river to Talcony Plantation to hard labor and swamp fever amid the cotton bowls. She was not alone in rage and spite and hurt and lashing out. The leaders of the South reacted the same way to the election of a president, Abraham Lincoln, who was opposed to slavery. They quit the United States and tried to form their own country. Civil War had come. Mr. Davis and others in gray uniforms fought for their freedom to deny John Roy his freedom. Northerners in blue battled just to preserve the Union. Then to strengthen that Union, President Lincoln declared that the slaves would be free. For John Roy, true emancipation came the summer he turned 16. It did not come from the president's pen or even from the arrival of 200 blue-clad men on horseback. It came instead when he sold a chicken for a dime to a Yankee soldier and bought himself a boat, boat ride across the river back to Natchez. Elsewhere, the war still raged. Here for John Roy Lynch, it was the beginning of an amazing age. First, he found a job. Four dollars he earned in one month as a waiter wasn't much, but it was four dollars more than he had earned before. It was a start. Searching for more satisfying work, he went from waiter to cook. Ah, the freedom to make such a move, and then from cook to a better paid pantry man on board the Altamont, Altamont, a Union transport steamer. It was on the Altamont, just after the war's end, that John Roy heard the news. President Lincoln was dead. John Roy and the white sailors were united, united with bowed heads, united with wet cheeks, united with broken hearts. When the Altamont chugged away, taking its crew home to the north, John Roy could have gone along. He had the choice to stay or go, and he chose to stay. Not just was his home, fellow former slaves reveled in the promises of freedom. Family, faith, free labor, land, education. 
John Roy wanted to be part of that. Freedom, however, soon turned sour. Mississippi whites passed laws to make Mississippi blacks into slaves under different names, apprentices, vagrants, convicts. Under those laws, the fines and jail time were harsh for black people who treated whites as equals, and harsher still for whites who treated black people the same. And sometimes hate-filled whites denied, dealt out penalties far worse than what the laws called for. In too many ways, this new world of black and white was just like the old one. But in another new world of black and white photography, John Roy had found opportunity. At 17, he became the messenger for a local portrait shop, and he soon took on more responsibility. Trusted to develop the photographs, John Roy continued to develop himself. He took note of everything, every detail of the operating the shop. Because the shop owner had John Roy Lynch, he didn't need anyone else. By 19, John Roy was running the place himself. Across the alley behind the shop sat a public school for white children, close enough for John Roy to see the blackboard and hear the teachers through the window. When the shop was quiet, John Roy went to class without setting a foot outside. At night school taught by Northerners, John Roy learned to compose letters, simple at first and then elegant and soaring. He read in newspapers about how unhappy the victorious North was with the stunted freedoms in the South. John Roy, John Roy knew that the changes would be coming to the Mississippi. When those changes came in 1867, it meant black men would be able to vote. Not John Roy, though. He was still too young. At the same time, he got involved in the Not Just Republican cult Club, making speeches and stirring up support for a new Mississippi constitution. And he began buying land. It hadn't been so long since John, had, John Roy had been forced to work on someone else's land, but now he owned a piece of this earth for himself. John Roy brought, bought more and more, including some property of his own on Humchito Street. In 1868, the U.S. government appointed a young Yankee general as governor of Mississippi. The whites who had been in charge were swept out of office. By river and by railroad, John Roy traveled to Jackson to hand Governor Ames a list of names to fill the, pos fill the positions in Natchez. After John Roy spoke grandly of each man's merit, the, j the governor added another name to the list, John Roy Lynch, Justice of the Peace. Justice, peace, black people saw reason to believe that these were now available to them. At just 21, John Roy doubted that he could meet all those expectations, but he dove in and learned the law as fast as he could. He settled disputes between servants and employers. He corrected whites who assumed the law still allowed them to mistreat black people. He hitched young couples in matrimony, then helped patch things up for the same pairs. And if the husbands mistakenly thought that John Roy could send them to prison if they didn't shape up, he let them keep right on thinking that. When election day came in just a few months' time, the people of Natchez elected John Roy to the Mississippi House of Representatives to help govern the whole state. He gained the power to change the law. Here and there around the state, white people tried to bully black voters away from the polls through whippings and beatings and threats. They didn't succeed, but they didn't give up either. Clearly, there was still work to do, and John Roy worked to make freedom, freedmen like himself truly free, not just in name alone, but full-fledged, fully educated citizens. Mississippi's people were, as a whole, poorly educated. The state sorely needed new schools for black and white alike, but who would pay for those schools? And what would happen to the cotton with the field hands in a classroom? The people elected leaders to answer those questions, and the leaders elected John Roy Lynch to lead them as Speaker of the House. John Roy was only 24 years old, and he was still on the rise. In 1872, voters all the way over to the Alabama border and down to the Gulf of Mexico elected him to the United States House of Representatives. It took several days for him to travel to Washington, D.C. The 10 years since he'd been a teenage slave on Talcony Plantation had gone by almost as fast. Too fast for some. U.S. congressmen or not, a black man could still find himself barred from certain hotels, but that wasn't the worst of it, not by far. Back home, white terrorists burned black schools and black churches. They armed themselves on election day to keep black people away. They even committed murder. In a way, the Civil War wasn't really over. 
The battling had not stopped, but white northerners had grown weary and the U.S. government wavered. Hard, hungry times came to the north, overshadowing injustices in the south. The decent people of Mississippi were not outnumbered, but they were outgunned and on their own. John Roy held on, would not be silenced. This was not who America was, he said, not who she should be, not what she must become. On the floor of the United States House of Representatives, this half-Irish, all-American, democratically elected former slave spoke these words. When every man, woman, and child can feel and know that his, her, and their rights are fully protected by the strong arm of a generous and grateful republic, then we can all truthfully say that this beautiful land of ours, over which the star-spangled banner so triumphantly waves, is in truth and in fact the land of the free and the home of the brave. If John Roy Lynch had lived a hundred years, and he nearly did, he would not have seen that come to pass. The years following his speech were filled with more disappointments as white people continued to push back against the freedoms that black people had gained. But John Roy never forgot that the period of reconstruction after the war had been an age of an amazing promise and potential, and he insisted that others remember this too. He continued to believe that the laws of this land could bring about justice. He continued to believe that the people of this land could bring about peace. Here's a historical note about the Reconstructionist period and a timeline of John Roy Lynch's life and um, state and national events that happened uh, around the same time. There's also, also an author's note and an illustrator's note and um, some further reading and some maps to help you understand a little bit more about Union states, territories, and then Reconstructed states. And there's also one more portrait of John Roy Lynch. I hope you enjoyed this book and learned a lot about the Reconstruction period, it's something that not many people know about. And a lot of people seem to think that, um, that black people's rights have just been getting better and better in this country ever since uh, slavery ended. But that's not true, as you can see. There was a time where they got better and then a time where they got worse right after that when Reconstruction ended. I hope you enjoyed learning about this though and that it, it changes the way that you think moving forward about ways that we can get back to doing Reconstructionist things. Uh, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for joining me today and I hope to see you again soon.